Hello, um, this is Adrian Bonsall. I'm at Derbyshire Canterbury Club and it's the 7th of November um, 2017. I'm here today to talk to Harold um, Rhodes. Um, Harold, in a previous interview we were, you were talking about um, your selection for England and playing in the two test matches. Um, I'm interested to know, you know what a county cricketer did in the winters um, Pre, almost pre-season at that time of, uh, uh, of, of you know, the 1950s and 1960s. What did you do? Well, I was fortunate. I, I did go on one or two tours. I, you know, um, I went to South Africa. Uh, I went round the world uh, with Richie Benno's side, um, and I went to the West Indies with with E. W. Swanton. So I was fairly well occupied. There was only I think a couple of winters or one winter when I worked for a travel agency. But during that time, I joined a, a club similar to what they have today up and down all these um, clubs, you know, like um, Lloyd's and places like that. And, and I joined a club on the spot and did a lot of weight training. And um, so that was the only time. Other than that, I was playing cricket 12 months of the year. On these overseas tours, who did you play with? Sir? Um, well, I mean, the first one I went on in 59, Dennis Compton was the captain, so mm. it shows you how long ago that was. I mean, Dennis was, had finished playing um, for Middlesex, but he was still a name and he could still play, and of course he was very popular in South Africa where he'd done well. So I was really chuffed to be on that tour, which was Ron Roberts got it together, who, you know... Um, one or two trips I did with Ron Roberts. I went round the world with him. I went to the West Indies with E.W. Swanton. Um, and I went round the world with Joe Lister. And then I did an MCC tour to the Far East. So I've not been idle. I have, you know, <laughs> played a lot of cricket. And which fast bowlers uh, did you bowl in tandem with, you know, on these tours? Any... Well, in South yeah. Africa, I, I opened the bowling with, uh, with Frank Tyson who was oh. probably the quickest bowler that, that drew breath. I mean, I never saw Harold Larwood, but Frank Tyson was quick. And then around the world, I, I played open the bowler with Neil Adcock, um, South African legend. Um, uh, I can't remember now who, who, who else um, I played with. Uh, the West Indies, of course, Ray Linwall was on that trip. Um, and then when we went around the world with, um, I can't think who the opening bowlers were there. Um, did, you, did you pick up any tips from these these players? Were they ha happy to give you advice? Uh, yeah, or, or? Um, you, you tend to find that people don't like to put get you on one side and shove mm. things down your throat. They, I think they expect you to, like I did really when I was at Derbyshire, learn just by listening and watching people uh, you know what they did and, and took it from there and and the same applied with Ray Linwall you know uh, I wasn't on a tour like that it wasn't like an Ashes tour or a mm. you know an England representative game it was a, a bit of social side to it really Colin Ingeborg McKenzie was captain in, in the West Indies so yeah. Ray Linwall really wouldn't have, have really I don't know, but I wouldn't have thought he'd want me to get hold of him and have half an hour or an hour with him talking about bowling because he, he liked the social side and he'd finished playing serious cricket in Australia. Yeah. So, you know, but I learnt a lot from He bowled and he could still bowl. And I, I watched him bowl and took a lot of note, you know, and learnt from that. OK. Neil Adcock as well, he was... Top top rate ball he was. I mean, I heard he was pretty quick. He was quick, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, going back to 1959, then uh, you played your two Test matches, um, and um, following year you were Derbyshire were playing um, South Africa uh, here. Um, what, what what's your recollections of, of that match uh, and the events that um, occurred during that match? In terms of, um... Well, I, I was staggered really because there was a lot of talk at the time about Jeff Griffin, uh, you know, and uh, he played in the same match. Um, and uh, 
anyway, I was called by, by Paul Gibb and it was a big, big shock. Uh, and then after the game, we went into the committee room and with Donald Carr and several committee people and Paul Gibb and asked him why. And he said, look, I, I don't necessarily think Harold throws. He said, but well, there's something different about his action. And according to the law, as it was written then, he could call me. He wasn't satisfied with my action. They did change it after that, that you had to be sure somebody was actually throwing. Mm. But at the time, it was if you were dissatisfied, if you weren't satisfied with the person's action. And that's what he said, you know. Um, and, and then the funny thing was, you see, that he called me again against Northampton in another county championship match when I bowled with a totally different action. I mean, for, for a period of a couple of months, Donald Carr said to me, well, look, why don't you show the MCC, as, who, who was the governing body then, wasn't the ECB, um, that you are trying to do something to eradicate any suspicion. So... Mm -hmm. I bowl like Les Jackson with my arm behind my back, like Les did, like a slinging action. And I got a hat trick. The first match I played, I got a hat trick at Oxford University. Um, and then I played at no against Northants here in a match, and Paul Gibb called me again with that action, which was impossible to throw. So it, this is when Cochrane, who was our consultant from the DRI, he said, I'm going to x-ray Harold, there's something wrong here. And this is when they found out about the Niper extension. That's what it was. So whatever action I used, it was always going to show that my arm bent back. Mm. And that was, that was what it was. When you remodelled your action, how long did it take you to do that? How many months? Um, what, to do what? When you remodelled your action. Um, well, no, a matter of very little time, really. It was... You know, I just naturally, you know, I knew how Les bowled and I just copied him, really, and I was able to bowl quite well with it. But I wasn't happy with it. It, was a, it was, wasn't natural for me to do that. I, w I was perhaps, you might say, naive in doing what Donald Carr said. But then again, he was my captain, and yeah. he, you know, was a big ECB man or MCC man, and uh, uh, he was, I suppose, in a way, trying to help me by saying, "Show them that you you are trying to do something." But it was I didn't do it for long. It was perhaps a month, two months, and then I went back to my old action, proper action. What what actually happened after the Paul Gibb called you? Uh, well, they took this film. Yeah. They took this film of me, at Lords from Long On, with a brownie camera, and they said to me, "Well, what do you think?" And I said, "It's awful." Like that. I said, was, I, this, "Was this when you were playing for the dog?" We're playing Middlesex, yeah. yeah, yeah. And he, I said, "I don't bowl like that. That's that's wrong." At first, I said, "That's not me," and the and, and Donald Carr said, "Well, it is you." And I said, well, I don't bowl like that, Skipper, you know, that's ridiculous. And they said, well, what, what do you want us to do? This is what we've got on, on film from one position. And I said, well, look, why don't you film the best action in the world? And Gubby Allen said, who's that? And I said, Fred Truman, of course he didn't like that. <laughs> but um, forget that. So uh, uh, I said, uh, he's got a great action. I said, everybody would like to model themselves on Fred Truman. I said, film him from the same position and just see what you get. And they did. They filmed him at Edgbaston from that same position. And believe it or not, he looked worse than I did. And they, they, it proved there and then that that was a bad position to film anybody from. The, the reason I was clued up on this was because I'd seen in the winter at some particular event, somebody showed some black and white film, and I saw a film of Harold Larwood bowling from the same position, and he looked like a chucker, mm. you know. And, and I thought to myself, well, he wasn't, but... That's the angle that's, that's, you know. So that that was what it was. And then when Sid Buller did me against South Africa at Chesterfield... What year was that? 65. Yeah, right. 
I knew then that there was a conspiracy, really, because Sid Buller was a good umpire, and he was a friend of mine, he was a nice chap. And they, um, when, he, when he called me at Chesterfield, nobody could believe it. It was unbelievable, really. It was, the crowd went berserk. It was, there was police holding people back. It was uh, things that, like that. Dramatic. Yeah, you don't find things on a cricket field like that yeah. anymore. It was really, and it was, you know, uh, there was another good umpire, Jack Crap, at the other end. He never said a word and yet Sid did. And then later on, I was, he, I was umpire, he was umpiring at um, Burton-on-Trent, Sid was. And uh, I, I just got fed up with this because he refused to look at some film that Derbyshire had taken, you know, and he refused to look at them. And um, I said to Sid, I, I, I bowled at his hand and he took my sweater and I said, Sid, there'll be a day of reckoning, you know, just like that. And he reported me, and Jack Barnett got me in the office and said, look, tongue-in-cheek, just write, and they want an apology. So I had to write and apologise to Sid Buller. Um, and then, late, not, not long after that, um, maybe the next season, I'm not quite sure of the dates, but they found him dead in, in the toilets at uh, Edgbaston. And I'm sure to this day that his premature death at 60 had a lot to do with that thing because he suddenly realised that what a good umpire he was as he'd been conned. He'd been, mm. They'd showed him this film of me at Lord's, which they knew wasn't right. They knew it was from one angle, but because I was top of the national averages, they couldn't pick me for England. They didn't want to because of this doubt, you know, and all this. And so, you know, then Sid suddenly realised, talking to other umpires who were saying, well, Sid, I think you're wrong, and all this, that and the other. And then something clicked to him to say, well, I've been conned. And I think, I don't know, uh, I, I didn't know that Sid had anything physically wrong with him, but to die at 60 like that, I don't know, I think something got, got to him. You know, I'm not saying anything <laughs> mysterious, but you know that it, it really worried him. And mm. Going back to the 1960 then, and, and when you were first called, and as you've just said, that England felt probably they couldn't select you. Um, following that, that, that uh, controversy. Um, you continued to run in hard, get the wickets for Derbyshire, um, and as you said, you were top of the averages. And, uh, what, what year? 1964, um, What were your feelings then in terms of, no matter how hard I perform um, for Derbyshire, that you were not going to get selected again for England? What, what well, I didn't, I didn't think that. I didn't think that I wouldn't be picked again. All, all I wanted to do was try and clear myself, but I didn't realise that I was up against uh, eventually politics as much as anything, and I, I didn't help playing for Derbyshire. You know, it, Derbyshire is an unfashionable county, and uh, I suppose in a way I was fortunate to play for England in the first place, but... Um, to get this cleared off and then be picked again. My father said to me, and it's in the book, I think, said, they'll never pick you again. I said, why not, Dad? He said, they're not big enough. Hmm. I always remember that. He said, they're not big enough. So, eventually, you were, you were cleared. Yeah. What, what year was that? Oh, well, 68. 68, yeah. And what happened as a result of that? Um, did they bring you down to Lords, or did they just set, said your action was no, acceptable? No, I, I think they just wrote to Derbyshire and said that, you know, after their conclusions came to the fact that after all of these years that they considered that, that my arm was hyperextended and that it it didn't conform to a throw. So, so it just it just rumbled on mm. for mm. eight years. Mm. Eight years, yeah. Terrible, isn't it? Yeah. 
maybe want to turn to next, Harold, is um, a match I, I was personally at, and that was the Derbyshire against um, Sussex match at um, Chesterfield in the Gillette Cup mm. uh, semi-final. Um, I think you were timed unofficially at that, that, mm. that match. Um, well, perhaps you want to tell the story. Um, yeah, well, I was told that, um, I didn't know about this at the time, but I was told uh, uh, two school teachers came to see me at the end of the game and said that they'd, uh, they'd time me with stopwatches. Uh, and they were obviously quite intelligent blokes, so I took it that, you know, they must have been fairly accurate. So they said the quickest ball you bowl was 95 miles an hour. So I was quite pleased about that. Yeah, and it was a momentous day anyway, wasn't mm. it? A mm. very hot day, mm. um, the packed, packed... But the, uh, the, the funny thing was that Alan Ward played in that game yes. yeah. and because he was um, doing quite well at the time and he was like just coming into the side, they gave him preference ends and he bowled down the hill, which usually I did, and I bowled from the lake end. Um, and uh, he got two wickets. I remember I bowled, was it four, five, six overs f for just four runs, and that was an edge through the slips, but I didn't get a wicket. And then Peter Air mopped them up and got six wickets. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Mm. Right. A momentous day, a momentous mm. day. Um, what happened then after 69? Um, you know, how did your career evolve? Um, after the uh, that one day match against Sussex. Oh, at 69? Yeah, after 69. Uh, well, I finished in 69. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I, I took it on that my father, you know, was right that I wasn't going to be picked for England again. I was 32, then 33, and uh, um, I was met. We played at Blackpool and uh, we won the game and uh, Derek said there's two couple of chaps to see you and from Burnley Cricket Club. So I went to see them and had a drink with them and they offered me a, a job as professional at Burnley, which I was there for three years, yeah. Mm. Okay. Which I enjoyed, yeah. Okay. Um, thank you, Harold. Um, I think we'll talk about the... Uh events after Burnley or um, the next uh, interview. Thank yeah, you. fine.